Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Good morning to you, good evening to you, good late night, and a special uh, hello to people from Portugal, Italy, and the UK, where it's some ungodly time of the morning. But also welcome to people from uh, Philips Neiser in New York and Obermeyer, who may have heard me again uh, before. And uh, look, before I start, I need to say a thank you to Wendy Horn, who has just been our, li our uh, liaison person, has done a fantastic job of getting this together. All right, so we're going to be talking about mental fitness, staying sane and focused. But I have to tell you from the start, this is not going to be a motivational talk. You won't be getting that much Aussie humor, but you will be getting a little bit of piano playing for a purpose. Your time is precious. And rather than being a motivational talk, I'm going to be brutally honest about what you need to do to overcome the problem. And the problem that we're looking at today is the problem of lawyers' mental health. Too much depression, too much addiction, too much alcohol use, too much anxiety, and too many suicides. We're going to do that by looking at the underlying mechanisms of the brain, and we'll draw particularly on the science of neurochemistry. And what I'm going to do is give you solutions which are actionable. So in other words, if you take this away and actually put it into practice, you will achieve the results that you actually want. And I'm going to give you the bottom line up front. The bottom line is that it is not the economy, it is not your workload, it is not a virus that leads to mental illness or to suicide. It is your internal mental state your thoughts and your emotions. And that is actually more under your control. You can keep mentally fit and sane if you have a plan and you respond to it by putting it into action. Okay, so that's the bottom line. And we're gonna go through all of that. Uh, and I'm not quite gonna get it to the 25 minutes that we need to be, but I will leave plenty of time for questions. Firstly, why am I talking to you about this. Okay, so firstly, I trained as a doctor. Then I worked in a, uh, a hospital for several years before specializing in psychiatry. And as Graham Parler let you know, I subspecialize in personal trauma. That is mainly war experiences and people who have been subjected to very serious childhood abuse, virtually sex slaves to somebody that they sh should have trusted. I have also taken care of a lot of addiction psychiatry and of course, schizophrenia, depression, bipolar and anxiety. So I've treated a lot of people who are lawyers. Lawyers actually have an empathic heart for people and lawyers get affected by the work that they do. Lawyers, of course, have the problems that all of us in society have, but there's a little bit more there as well. And just a few days ago, I had to take care of a legal matter that involved a lawyer's hardship and somebody's death, okay? It was just too hard. Okay, but I also have a PhD. I am also an academic. And my area, strangely enough, is preventing trauma or preventing mental health in you. And I have a music background, as you know, and my particular interest in law actually comes because my son is now working for a law firm in Sydney, and he's introduced me to the whole of the legal culture, and I thank him for that. I have to let you know that the information I'm gonna give you is deceptively simple. I had a choice between impressing you with a lot of stats, with a lot of figures and a lot of high flown knowledge, or to give you actionable, practical, memorable, not tips, but information that will help you. It's based on a lot of theory. It's based on a lot of evidence and it's based on my clinical experience. I'll be using an acronym to place it into your brain so that you will remember it and you won't forget. I will ask you to write things down because I would like this talk to make a difference in your life, your professional life, and in your personal life. Because here's the thing, you can actually have it all. You can be the lawyer that you want to be and live the life that you want by putting an action plan into place. So my question is always going to be, how are you going to respond to this? Let's start, I'm gonna start off with a story. This story was about a job going at a farm and a stock horse decided, look, I like the look of that um, 
uh, job. I am going to apply for this job. This stock horse got this job at the farm and he found it was a good farm, but he had to work from sunrise to sunset. He got some decent feed. He got a little bit of uh, time to himself, but he was working hard. He was uh, bringing cattle in. He was plowing things. He was doing all sorts of stuff and he worked hard. Next to him was another horse, but this horse was different. This horse was groomed every day. This horse had the best feed that money could buy. This horse was wearing coats of fine linen. This horse had its tail braided. It got taken out for rides every day. And every couple of weeks or so, it participated in a race. And the stock horse said to this horse, why are you treated so well? And the horse said, because I am a thoroughbred racehorse. I have been bred to win and they take care of me so that I can do that. So my question to you is, do you feel like a thoroughbred racehorse? Because that is what you as a lawyer actually are. Or do you feel like a stock horse that's being whipped around and is working far too hard? You are a thoroughbred racehorse. And what I would like to impart to you is a thoroughbred racehorse mentality. This is what we know about lawyers. As a child, you are a high achiever. You are one of the smartest kids in your class. You may have been school captain. You may have been ducks. You were also idealistic. You wanted to make the world a better place. Is that you? Is that something that you can relate to? By the time you got to university, strange because you were actually among the people who drank alcohol the least at university. You were chosen to be at university because you could achieve and you were highly intelligent. That's what people wanted from you. But within the five years or so that it took for you to get your degree, 70% of you had mental health issues. 40% of you were depressed. 25% of you were already on their way to an alcohol problem. But it's okay because when you joined the bar and you were asked about your character and uh, all of a sudden they found out that you didn't have any mental health issues, that you were okay. You were set to go. All right, now I've got to pause right there at a start, okay? You haven't started work yet as a lawyer and already the law culture has changed you from somebody who did not have alcohol issues or depression to somebody who does, okay? So the point that I want to make is that it's not you. It is the culture and the culture is changing. That's the good news, that's the hope. And the good news is also that you could put in a plan so that you can actually be the racehorse that you want to be, okay? All right, so let's take a junior lawyer. You start work. You're a problem solver because as a lawyer, you have so many problems that you have to solve. In fact, you have so many problems at work that you personally are not allowed to have problems. If you have problems, nobody's interested in it. Nobody's interested in it at work. And there's a perception in the public that you get paid too much to have problems. So nobody's gonna to listen to your problems. So you focus on your work. You have to do your best every day. So you become a perfectionist. Why do you have to do your best? because everything you do is important. You cannot make mistakes. The work that you do means that somebody's property is at stake, somebody's freedom, somebody's life, somebody's justice and or high financial stakes. There is nothing that you do as a lawyer that is trivial. You have to know and you have to be prepared and you have to work hard almost every day. Is that you? Remember, you're a thoroughbred racehorse. You can actually handle all of this. But if you handle it, then other people will ask you to do more. But hold on, you ask yourself to do more. You are such a high achiever that you start demanding more of yourself. Because I mean, as a junior, you've never felt disillusioned about your work, have you? You've never set the bar too high for yourself. You've never put rules on yourself to do better. You never feel scrutinized by the work that you do. So you'd never make the mistake of thinking, you know what? I'd better stay up tonight 
and get this memo done to have it on somebody's desk at nine o'clock in the morning rather than at five o'clock in the afternoon like I was asked to. You would never make that mistake. You would never think that I will look better if I do something like that, okay? You don't have those sort of rules. Now you do. I know that you rule, uh, that you do. How do I know? Because I had met so many people who work this way and being a perfectionist myself, I have to battle this myself, okay? But you wouldn't think that thoroughbred horses would ever be pushed to win beyond their capacity, beyond the capacity of even their own bones during a big race. They wouldn't, would they? Nobody would push them and they wouldn't push themselves, would they? Unfortunately, the thoroughbred horse that I'm talking about is a real horse. This horse, Anthony von Dyke, was one of the best race horses in the world until he was destroyed about a fortnight ago. You see, this horse had won the Epsom Derby. This is one of the most famous races in the world. It's about as famous as the Kentucky Derby, and it was taken over here to Australia to be entered into the Melbourne Cup. And in the Melbourne Cup, the horse pushed itself too hard, or it was pushed too hard, but it pulled up. It broke a bone in its leg. And later that day, it was euthanized. There is now an inquiry going on as to why in the last eight years, seven horses, thoroughbred racehorses have lost their lives in one race in the Melbourne Cup on that one day. Just like there is an international inquiry going on as to why so many lawyers are taking their own lives. So many lawyers are depressed, anxious, and have alcohol problems. All right, let's go to the horse. This horse was being groomed, given the best food, given the best physical training, and the best accommodation. Why? Because we wanted this horse to keep its body in peak physical condition. This horse's body was this horse's asset. Now let's look at you as a lawyer. What is your asset? Your asset is not in your physical fitness. It is not in how fast you can run. It is not how strong you are. It is not in how pretty you think you look. Although I know some people think that that's an asset in your industry. No, your asset is actually your brain. You rely on your brain every day. And so you want to keep your brain in peak mental fitness so that you can stay sane and focused. So what we're going to do here is take care of your brain. But this is what your brain is up against. And this is the, the stats side of what I'm going to do. There are only two stats that I need you to know. The first stat comes from a, uh, large, um, a large survey done in 2016. Lead author is Patrick uh, Krill. And this study of 18,000 lawyers found that 23% have an alcohol problem, 24% are depressed, anxiety is a big issue, and an alcohol problem of four times the limit of the population, right? Now, another study actually found that our, uh, lawyers actually have a problem with alcohol that is seven times the general population. Suicide is another problem. Okay, now suicide is a problem for all of society. In the USA, the suicide rate has increased by 33% since the year 1999. That is astounding. All of society has a problem with people deciding to check out. And I'm going to take you to somebody that I'm going to call Bill, who was a lawyer. Now, by the way, when I tell patient stories, I don't actually share patient stories. I don't disclose a single patient's story. What I do is I get the emotional content of an experience that several of the people that I have treated have, and then I use factitious ideas so that I keep the emotional content alike, but this is actually about a fictitious character, but it's based on the experience of, unfortunately, too many, usually five or six real people. Back to Bill. 
Bill was a lawyer. He was married, had four kids. He was a church organist and his hobby was playing music. Okay. And he did it with several friends, including a good friend of his who was a psychologist. Now, Bill was a thoroughbred racehorse. He could handle heaps of stress, uh, but when life got too complex for him, and to this day, we don't know why he actually took his life, but we assume that something happened at work, something that became too complex for him, and he couldn't talk to anybody about it because the stigma issues are so high. So all of a sudden he became anxious and anxiety led to depression. Depression led to low serotonin levels in his brain. And in that state, he was not thinking straight as in, and in within a matter of two weeks, he went from a family guy who had it all to destroying himself. There are too many stories like Bill, you know them. And it can go very quickly, which is why I don't want any of us to be complacent. This is what the brain does. It will go, 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 go. Then all of a sudden, if it's too complex, it'll go and it's unpredictable. Psychiatrists are as useless as the rest of the population in predicting suicide, okay? It is a real problem. So preventing suicide is actually more of a problem. And that's where I'm going to have to ask you to come in to look at this plan, to respond to it, okay? Oh, wait, everything that I've just told you up until now was pre-COVID. COVID has done so much damage to our mental health and our treatment of COVID has only added to our mental health burden. We don't have the stats, but this is the only stat that I need you to remember. Since COVID, things have gotten worse. It is like all of us, are carrying an extra 20 kilograms of anxiety because all of us, if we talk about it or not, are more anxious. We've had to confront our own mortality or we've had to confront the meaning of our whole existence. We've had to confront our broken dreams and uncertainty. We've had to go through lockdowns and change in the way things are going to go, but the expectations out there in the workforce have not changed. All anecdotal evidence tells us that suicides, depression and anxiety, domestic violence and alcohol problems have risen. And why this is such a problem for people in the law industry is that because as a lawyer, particular as a junior lawyer, you get paid in future earnings. You work hard because somebody says, you know what, one day, you can make associate, you can make past, uh, partner, you can make senior. It's the same in my industry. We get paid in future earnings and in future prestige. They ask us to delay gratification and we do it. We are actually the best people in the world that do it. But you see, COVID has led us to believe, you know what, we may not get back to what we had. We have broken dreams. Maybe I won't get that payoff that I'm working so hard for the moment, okay? Also, living at home. Lawyers tend to be in three groups now. The first group are the people that say, working from home, this is fantastic. I get to have breakfast with my kids. I get to have dinner with my kids. No transport. I get more work done at home. I get to control my life. And this is wonderful. The second group. I'm at home, the kids are around me, that puts more pressure on me, my spouse is putting more pressure on me, I can't handle all of this, I feel guilty if I'm not spending time with the kids, I'm feeling guilty if I don't spend more time at work, I'm trying to get more work done, but I can't, please can I go back to work? And then the third group are the people who are mainly alone, they're getting a lot of work done, but they are getting lonelier and lonelier and lonelier, and they're putting their heart, hand up to say, could I get back to the office soon? Okay, we all know the answer to this. The answer to this is to take care of yourself like a thoroughbred racehorse. Eat well, sleep well, take care of your relationships, socialize well, relax, stay away from drugs. You know all of that, but knowledge is not enough. You need an experience and you need a plan so that you can actually do that. And that's what I'm going to do. I hope that you can relate to what I'm talking about here. 
So we're going to start to delve into the brain. And I'm going to do something very strange at the moment. I'm going to sacrifice about two minutes of this lecture time to take you into a different world, to give your brain a break. Because what we're doing right now, this is part of your work. This is part of your brain trying to solve problems. It's trying to solve the problem of how can I stay mentally sane and fit. But we're going to suspend all of that because stress is not good for the brain. It depletes brain chemicals. So we're going to create just a little space to de-stress. So wherever you are, I'd like you to stand up or at least sit so that you can breathe really properly. And I'm going to play some music for you. One of the most gorgeous piano pieces ever written by Johann Sebastian Bach. And you're just going to focus on this. This is going to be your new world. And as you focus, you're going to breathe in and you're going to breathe out. All the stress will go out. You're going to breathe in fresh air and you're going to feel some tension in the music and then you're going to breathe out. You need to feel some relaxation in the music and you're going to breathe the stress out. You're going to breathe in fresh air and you're going to breathe out. In, out. In, out. In, I played about half the piece of music for you there. If you want to follow it up, uh, it's on the internet. Andre Schiff does actually the best rendition of this. Find that and you can just breathe in and breathe out. Why did I do this? Firstly, to create a space in your mind that was stress-free, that had nothing to do with trying to improve anything, that was just having an experience. And this piece will relate directly to one of the four take home messages that I'm going to give you because I'm going to start general and then I'm going to go to these specific four take home messages that will give you an action plan so that you can do it. All right. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go into your brain. If your greatest asset is your brain and it is, then we're going to take care of it like we take care of a thoroughbred racehorse's body. Stress is bad for the brain. Look, uh, stress is bad for your whole body. OK, the number of heart attacks that people have, particularly in the law industry, is disproportionate to the general population. Uh, I did my own private little study of people who lead very stressful lives, chess champs, uh, not that their lives are particularly stressful, but what goes on inside their head is so stressful. Every move that a chess champion makes could be a mistake that will lead to death. Every game that they play is a war to the death. And they just sit there like this, which means that all the stress is going inside the body. The average life expectancy of chess champions uh, up until about 1980 was in their 50s or their 60s, okay? Not very impressive. An orchestral conductor who has about as stressful a life as a chess champion, as far as the outside's concerned, inside their mind, they are doing something that they love. They are doing something that just involves beauty and harmony and goodness and peace. Plus, by doing this all day long, they're doing a bit of exercise. And exercise is very good for the brain, the heart and everything. The average life expectancy of orchestral conductors in the same period of time into their 80s and their 90s. That's a 30 year difference based on exercise and de-stressing the mind. 
All right, I told you that stress depletes brain chemicals. I'm going to talk about four feel-good brain chemicals. Dopamine, which mediates our feelings of pleasure. Oxytocin, which mediates our feelings of love and trust, even in a business transaction. Serotonin, which mediates anxiety and calm. And beta endorphins, which are not released just through exercise, but are released by being together with other human beings, laughing, singing, drumming, making music, and just being at a bar with a drink in your hand, giggling at some person that you've never met before. That leads to beta endorphin release, and it's good for us. Here's what happens when we deplete those chemicals. Low dopamine leads to depression, anxiety, and dread, an actual fear that all of life is not worth living. If you compensate by getting too much dopamine, which is what amphetamines give you or some uh, addictions that are on the internet, that leads to psychosis. So dopamine, you need the right balance. Oxytocin, a, if you have depleted oxytocin, that leaves you vulnerable to depression and anxiety, to moodiness, you get prone to addictions and you lose your empathy for other people, right? Which means that you connect less with other people and you're able to connect less with other people, which means you get even less oxytocin. Serotonin, if you have lowered serotonin, which is what stress does, depression, anxiety, okay? And beta endorphin, if you don't get enough laughter and goodness in your life with other people, you become a grumpy worry wart. And again, depression and anxiety, moodiness, you get prone to addictions. All right, so they're the problems. Now, most people think, okay, what can I eat? What can I take to increase these hormones in my brain? Nothing, there are things that you can do. And this is what the four take home messages are going to be. And so the four take home messages are an acronym, RSVP, which is why I'm going to ask you, how are you going to respond to what I am giving you at the moment? What is your RSVP? I'm going to go through all of those. This will give you the brain chemicals. The R is relationships. Okay. By the way, I need you to write this down or to put a, something on your computer. All right. Um, four take home messages, RSVP. I need you to have that down. Okay. So that you can actually do it. Write it down. The R is for relationships because relationships, the people who are close to us, the people who we see as family and friends and how we get on with people in greater society is the one thing that can give you the right dose of all of these brain chemicals. We get pleasure from people, dopamine. We get love and trust from other people, oxytocin. We get serotonin from other people. We get beta endorphins from other people, relationships. So right now, I need you to write down the names of the five closest people to you because I will ask you to take care of these people in your lives. You have already thought who they are. You know who they are. Quickly write down they are as I tell you a story. I used to work as a musician in an orchestra uh, doing Broadway shows. And I had a friend who was a violinist and he turned up to work one night and he was in tears. At interval, I asked him what was happening. And he said to me, it's all over between me and Nadine. And I said, what happened? And because I know that he and Nadine had been living together for over four years. And he said, well, I always wanted to be honest with Nadine. And that sounds okay. But I asked him what he was being honest about. And he said, well, <clears throat> I said she was really important to me, but that my violin was always going to be more important to me. So all of a sudden, I thought, how did Nadine stick it out for four years? Because and excuse the pun, but who wants to play second fiddle to a violin, right? But here's the thing, with people who you love and people who love you, they do not want you to give up what you love. They do not want you to do less work. They want you to be happy. They want you to be fulfilled. They want you to succeed, but they want to be taken care of as well. So this is why you can have it all if you can take care of those five people that you have 
written down. That is part of staying sane and focused on life as well as work. It's part of your mental fitness. All right, number two. Number two, oh, okay, no, I've, I've got to tell you something else about relationships because as a lawyer, the work that you are doing means that you are swimming in a sea that is really turbulent. You've got waves coming at you all the time. The people in your life are actually ropes that keep you safe, okay? And we've all got a bunch of ropes. But if you've cut off your relationship with your parents and haven't been speaking with them, you've got less ropes. If you haven't seen your cousins for a while, you've cut off more ropes. If there's a friend that you've had a falling out with and you haven't reconciled, you've cut another rope. You are in the still, you are still in the same turbulent seas and you have less ropes. How many more ropes can you cut before you sink? That's why I want you to take care of your relationships. That's the first one. R is relationships. Take home message number two is serenity. Find your serenity. This is why we listen to the music. This is why I have this in my life. This is my serenity. I spend time with this every day. And during that time, I don't have to achieve anything. Because after all, I, like you, are a human being. I am a human being. I am not a human doing. At work, you are doing things all the time. And you get judged on how you do those things. But you are not a human being doing, you are a human being, which means you need time in your life. And I would suggest every day, 10 or 15 minutes, when you can just be yourself, be a human being. For some people, it's reading. For some people, it's walking. For some people, it's getting a surfboard and getting to the surf one hour a week. For some people, it is nature. For some people, it is listening to music. For some people, it is just sitting in a tree that has been their childhood friend because they just feel good next to that tree. Whatever does it for you, meditation or something, find your serenity. That's what the S is for. S is for serenity. That's number two. Number three is V in RSVP. Oh, by the way, write down what your serenity is. You already know what it is, but you need to have it written down or else you may not make it the priority that I'm asking you to make it. The V is values. Know your values and live your values out. I'm going to take you back to your first day of university. You made it. You are in university. You are going to be a lawyer. Why did you study law? Why did you want to become a lawyer? What was it in you that was inspired, and I mean inspired, to become a lawyer? Did you have some of those crazy idealistic notions that maybe you could make the world a better place? Like Nelson Mandela, Mahatma Gandhi, Abraham Lincoln, or any of the other hundreds of great human beings that we have had through the ages that have been lawyers, okay? Did you think that maybe you could make a difference like, uh, like Roosevelt, okay, Barack Obama, whoever your idol is, inspires you, look to their values and make them your own. Okay, many of us are goal driven <clears throat> and you may know that, okay, if you've got goals, then you can sort of get somewhere. But I'm going to give you a story where goals can get in your way. And this concerns somebody who came to see me and the first day he saw me, I chatted and asked, okay, so what's the problem? And he said, well, I got my PhD. And I said, congratulations. How long did that take you? He said, three years. But in those three years, my wife has left me. My children are not speaking to me. And I have had this mental breakdown and I am here talking to you. He got his goal, but he lost the things he values. Now, the thing is, it's fine to have goals. He could have got his PhD, maybe it would have taken a little bit longer. Maybe he needed to tweak some of the ways that he treated other people. But do not go for goals and leave your values alone because you will make mistakes which will cost you dearly. Because when you're on your deathbed, right, right then, you had a vision. And I'm going to ask you, 
who was there with you, right? Write down who was there on your deathbed because you want to make sure that those people are actually there whenever that time comes, which means you have to value them above your goals because we tend to go for goals which we can measure. A race, I can win this. Um, a certain amount of money, I can get this. Uh, a case or a matter, I can win this, okay? This is how you get to know your goals. Spend some time, three hours, in nature or by yourself in your favorite chair and write down these four questions. One, what motivates me to do well? Number two, what do I most admire in myself and others? Number three, what do I believe is the right thing for me to do? And number four, when do I feel most fulfilled and most full of self-respect? I'm going to go through those again. Number one had to do with motivation. What motivates me to do well? Number two had to do with admiration. What do I admire in myself and others? Number three was the right thing. What do I believe is the right thing for me? And number four is when do I feel most fulfilled? Okay, coming down the home stretch, number four. RSVP, the P is for plan. Plan to do this. Plan to put it into action. Lawyers, I am told, are good at making lists. You've got a to-do list of what you've got to do every day to keep on top of things in yourself. Have this as a to-do list. Have a journal or a computer file. Write down the relationships, the R that you need to take care of. Write down the S, what your serenity is. Write down the V, what your values are and live out of those. And then the P is, this is your plan. Look at it every day so that you can be the thoroughbred racehorse that you actually are. So my question is, how are you going to respond to this? What is your RSVP? Relationships, serenity, values, and plan. And that way, you can actually be mentally fit and stay sane. Thank you very much for listening.